Greetings everybody, it's Jesse here, and uh, we're going to kind of do like a mini study here, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's, uh, it's we're going to be talking about Antipas, Antipas, and um, what's very unique is you can search throughout the whole Bible, you can search everywhere, and you will only find it in one little verse, and that's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Um, obviously in secular history you, you had um, Herod the Great Son who uh, had the name Antipas attributed to him but it's not the same one obviously when you read Revelation 2.12 and 2.13 where it states unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And uh, it's very interesting when you, when you trace this to um, Revelation 13, when it talks about the beast out of the sea. And, um, and it talks about that Satan gave him, the dragon gave the beast, its power and great authority. Okay. <coughs> And if, you know, careful study about the beast and everything, you'll realize that the, that the uh, beast is uh, Rome, essentially. Um, <clears throat> you look at the characteristics of the beast and then you apply that to the beast in Daniel chapter 7. And you can readily see that uh, the uh, beast applies to Rome. And it applies to Rome today. I mean, nothing's changed. It's still the same. You know, in the midst of all, uh, in the midst of all kinds of confusion and uh, prophecy seminars and these types of things, you you know, it's still the same thing. It always was and always will be the seat of Satan. Now, <clears throat> in literal terms. Pergamos is where Satan's seat is. Um, metaphorically, Satan's seat is the Vatican, essentially. <clears throat> so I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Okay. Now, I want to read this again. Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now, if Satan's seat, metaphorically, is in, is in Rome, Vatican City, the Vatican, essentially, and, um, and this beast has power and control throughout the then known world we're talking about you know the dark ages reformation era you know and you know and these types of things um when you look at this metaphorically antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where satan dwelleth okay were, were there not many martyrs of the faith during that time okay were they not faithful okay that's what you have to look at. Now, a brief synopsis of the possible martyrdom of the actual Antipas is, I can't provide you a link. This is out of my own uh, library of sorts, um, Anchor Bible Dictionary. Um, this is a brief synopsis of a po of possible martyrdom. Um, this is not, it's not confirmed. You know, this is just speculation of what could have happened. So... I can't say that this is verbatim, but this is um, what has been written about him. Not much has been written about him. Um, they, you know, speculation has been that he was ordained by uh, the Apostle John and these types of things. But he was a martyr of the church in Pergamum. I'm reading out of the Anchor Bible, Anchor Bible Dictionary. 
a martyr of the church in Pergamum, described as Christ's faithful witness in Revelation 2.13. Okay. The same description as given to Christ himself in Revelation 1.5. So if you want to go ahead and look that up real quick. Pause me if you have to pause me. Uh, and look that up. And legend among later hagiographers, e.g. Simon Metaphrase and the Bolandus, has it that Antipas was slowly roasted to death in a brass bowl during the reign of Domitian. Now, during the reign of Domitian, I mean, like I said, there, there, there isn't really too much sources to confirm that. But um, during the reign of Domitian, there was a lot of martyrdom taking place. And, you know, so it is a very strong possibility that that's how his martyrdom uh, happened, was that he was slowly roasted to death inside of a brass bowl um, at Rome. So that's basically a brief synopsis of the literal Antipas. Excuse me. Now, I'm going to scroll down here. <clears throat> We're going to dive deep in this. We're going to split split this up anti and pos and we're going to look at this very carefully now the word anti comes from strong's g473 anti which means over against opposite to or before so anti could mean something against against something okay were there not um Brethren, were there was the church not against the papacy? Was not a you know was the was the church against the papacy? Papacy was the, was the church against Rome and these types of things? Absolutely, opposite to or before. And as far as Antichrist is concerned, let's see. Antichrist doesn't claim that he is against Christ. So. Um, this is where this applies to, and because it also can mean for instead of or in place of, or instead of. Okay, so that's what basically antichrist means. Means in, in place of. And splitting the word antipas up, when you look at the context of antipas being the faithful martyr and witness of Jesus, who was slain among those of Pergamos and then you apply that metaphorically to uh, Rome and the control that she had during that time um, of great persecution and apostasy you can clearly see that this is that this word against anti applies to antipas now pas means potier or potier Comes from the Strong's G, which is Greek three thirty nine sixty two, Padier, which um, I'm not going to read all of the all of the definitions. You can look up the Strong's number yourself and, and uh, read it in full. But I'm going to um, go over some highlights, which uh, could very well link um, <clears throat> this to Antipas, especially metaphorically, because we're kind of looking, I, you know, I gave you the synopsis of the literal Antipas, possibly, and his possible martyrdom. Now we're looking at the metaphorical sense, okay? Anti means against, potter, which means, or potier, which means either the nearest ancestor, father of the corporeal nature, or corporal nature, Natural fathers, of course, you know, your mom, your dad, both parents. The, you know, potier can be applied there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> metaphorically, the originator and transmitter of anything, the author of a family or society of persons animated by the same spirit as himself. Okay. 
and John it talks about that spirit of Antichrist. Okay. John also says there are many Antichrists. We see um is it in Matthew twenty four, which says that many will come in my name. See, they're gonna come in Christ's name. They're not gonna be against Christ. But they are going to be coming in my name. Basically in a sense of, well, I mean, what does, what did it say? In place of, in place of Christ. Coming in my name, coming in the place of, you know, so you can apply that. That's in Matthew 24. Um... And that can very easily be attributed to the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, animated by the same spirit as himself. Now, <clears throat> the second one really um, takes the cake for me. And it says, one who has infused his own spirit into others, who actuates and governs their minds. Okay, I'm not going to get into it. Um, in this video, but I might read a little bit of the uh, rulers of evil, especially in the uh, um, the chapter where it talks about learning against learning. Okay, it's a very very interesting chapter, and um, <laughs> it really spells this out because a lot of people think of this um, now. This Antichrist figure uh, as just being a physical um, manifestation, which he is, you know, but it is also a society of persons. It is a dynasty of persons, okay? And this, and the spirit of this dynasty permeates throughout the whole world. So, even though we see this in the physical, this is actually working as a spiritual thing as well both in and at the same time <clears throat> and again one who has infused his own spirit into others who actuates and governs their minds why is this important well in revelation 13 there's a little piece of it right here it states all the world wandered not wa as in just following after the beast but wandered after the beast. So this has something to do with the mind. This has something to do with the mindset. Okay. And the tricky thing is a lot of people go throughout their lives not even knowing that they could be wandering after this beast. Because you got to remember, this beast is a not only a religious entity, but it's also a political one. Okay, so rather you be an atheist or an agnostic, or and you're totally against religion and you're totally against the church and these types of things, just by your actions of how you live your life is actually when you look at deep down in the political socialist view of the church. You are wandering after the beast, and you don't even know it. Okay? That's that's the subtlety here. All the world wandered after the beast. So the word wandered, I took this from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, which I think has the most purest definitions of uh, the English language for uh, wander. means that emotion which is excited by novelty or the presentation to the sight or mind of something new, unusual, strange, great, extraordinary, or not well understood. Something that arrests the attention by its novelty, grandeur, or inexplicableness. Wonder expresses less than astonishment and much less than amazement. It differs from admiration and not being necessarily accompanied with love, esteem, or approbation, nor directed to persons. See? You don't have to like the religion of the Catholic Church, you do not have to like religion in general. 
Okay, but the spirit that protrudes out of the system more or less has a profound effect in the believer's life, in the unbeliever's life, in all the world. Okay? <clears throat> this is why when it comes to the whole Mark of the Beast issue, a lot of people think it's going to be a physical thing and these types of things. And yeah, there might be some physical attributes to it, but that's not as that's not what is going to cause you to get your name blot out of the book. Okay, it's the spiritual that it's the metaphorical aspect of the mark that is the most dangerous. Okay, because this mark of the beast, especially in the forehead, when you apply that to people today, all you have to do is just look at the mindset of that individual the best you can. Use discernment. Are they acting as they are friends with the world? Because friendship with the world is enmity with God, so therefore he who is... A friend of the world is an enemy of God, right? So, therefore, if that person's mind is banked on the things of this world, then, essentially, when it comes down to brass tacks, they are in lockstep with the mark of the beast. Okay? Now, we know that... Sunday is uh, is is the church's mark of authority and stuff like that. But I think it goes beyond just Sunday keeping and Sabbath keeping. Okay. Um, this is... <laughs> sounds like the Matrix. This is a battle for the mind. Okay. Where is your heart? You know, the mind and the heart is basically one and the same thing. A lot of times in the Bible when it speaks of the heart, it's speaking of the mind and stuff like that. <coughs> Um, so when you're looking at that word wandered after the beast it is not like a li literal physical following because you don't even have to be incorporated into within the beast to be wandering after the beast okay <clears throat> um, a very clear cut example is the book Ecclesiastical Megalomania and I really need to read portions of that book because that really expounds upon the politics, um, especially with what we're going into now in today's day and age with everything being acceptable and certain things that were the norm, you know, the right thing is kind of being pushed aside. <clears throat> and, um, and everything is being accepted, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me again. So that's another example of wander. It, it, it goes just beyond, you know, something physical like a chip or anything like that. Um, because if you're wandering after the beast, chances are you are in danger of having that mark of that beast. <clears throat> Finishing off the definition, but wonder sometimes is nearly a lie to astonishment, and the exact extent of the meaning of such words can hardly be graduated. Okay, so again, one who has infused his own spirit, this is what father can mean also metaphorically, uh, into others who actuates and governs their minds. And then when you look at the phrase, all the world wandered after the beast, um, this is it, it, it can be very it can be very sobering okay <clears throat> so what have we um, uncovered here with uh, Antipas well Antipas means against in the context of Revelation 213 against the father 
okay? And this father is not Father God. It's um, <clears throat> it's a metaphorical father. It is a Mithraic father, and we're going to get into that here in a moment. Um, it is the author of a family or society of persons animated by the same spirit as himself, and one who has infused his own spirit into others who actuates and governs their minds. This can apply directly to the papacy, because the head of the church... The Roman Catholic Church is the Pope, and the Pope in Latin is Papa, which stems from the Greek patir, which means father. Okay? Now, I mentioned Mithraism, or, yeah, I mentioned Mithraism. Why? Because Roman Catholicism, in a nutshell, is essentially myth Mithraism. It, it it draws from Mithraism, okay? And Mithraism is basically, in a sense, the same thing as Gnosticism. That's why, and I haven't completed the reading yet, I've been doing this um, synopsis of Simon Magus, okay? Because Simon Magus, really, in all actuality, when they say Peter was the first pope, in a sense, they're right, but it's not Peter the Apostle. It is Simon Peter, Simon Magus, okay, so they do have a Peter, but it's not the Peter that, you know, many like to believe, or that they tell us to believe, so Peter, Potier, means father, so let's go ahead and uh, take a gander at this, this is, um, I'm going to move this up a little. This is the seven grades of initiation. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm just going to read a, you know, a couple of things here. I'm going to read this paragraph, and it states, We come now to the question of the initiate's chances of promotion within the seven grades. We do not know whether he remains simply a member of the fraternity throughout his life or whether he could in time rise to higher office. The average follower of Mithra almost certainly did not advance to a to a higher grade. That would be like, for example, in the Catholic Church, you know, just your everyday Catholics, okay? Either because he did not manifest a sufficient sense of dedication to his God or because he lacked the necessary education or sometimes perhaps because he lacked the necessary funds. To be able to climb the symbolic seven steps of the ladder, which led ultimately to the select of father of fathers. That's the highest grade of Mithraism. He's starting to see a pattern. <clears throat> but he who accumulated sufficient theological knowledge and acquired an insight into the astronomical and astrological theories of the Mithraic cult, in short, he who fulfilled certain requirements could gain successively the titles of raven, bride, soldier, you know, think of Knights of Malta and the Jesuit order, lion, Leo, Persian, Perses, courier of the sun, and father. Potier. Numerous inscriptions and discoveries in both East and West confirm this information as recorded by the church father Hier Hieronymus, 4th and 5th centuries AD, and shows that the sequence of the seven grades was the same throughout the whole extent of the Roman Empire. Empire. And they give you a brief dis uh, description of each of the grades. They have Corax the Raven, Nymphus the Bride, at the initiation of the uh, the initiation of the bride, the clasping of the right hand. This is in in the Mithraic cult. The clasping of the right hand as a pledge of fidelity and alliance plays an important part. This gesture was used by the Persians as well as the Romans and is often portrayed on Roman sarcophagi. Now you have the soldier, which will be step number three. Leo the lion, step number four. Perseus the Persian, step number five. Heliodramas, a courier of the sun. <clears throat> and Peter the father. And this is the one I wanted to read to you. 
This is the highest of the grades in the Mithraic cult, is the deputy on earth of the god himself, and is therefore portrayed clothed like Mithra. He is father to his initiates, who call themselves Freighters, or Brothers, we hear that word from the Pope nowadays, don't we? And guards over the interests of his community. He is also the Magister uh, Sacrorum, the teacher whose wisdom is symbolized by a ring and the staff. He is the ma the the Magus or the Sophistes. Magus si Simon Magus. Does that ring a bell, Simon Magus? The high priest who has been chosen by his fellow initiates as the lawful father at the mysteries, and as such he carries the responsibility for dispensing initiation to the different grades and for accepting new members. At Dura Europus we encounter an antipatos, possibly a preliminary grade to that of father, while in Rome there are the Pater Sacrorum, the father of the mysteries, and the Pater Patrum, the father of fathers, is the great shepherd. Does that ring a bell? For an inscription records a, quote, father of the fathers from amongst the ten superiors. Seven heads, ten horns. Ten horns or ten kings. And the Pater Patrum, this father of fathers, is the great shepherd, for an inscription records a father of the fathers from amongst the ten superiors. He is a representative of the Pietus, and hence Pius, Pientissimus, or Sanctus, and he is supremely worthy. He has also studied astrology, and no wonder, for the whole of the Mithraic mysteries is steeped in astrological concepts. You can say the same thing for the Catholic Church as well, from which stem the doctrine of the seven grades, which, as we have seen, were placed under the protection of the seven planets, the Patir standing under the guardianship of Saturn. Above him at Santa Prisca are these words, Hail all fathers from east to west under the protection of Saturn. At Astaya, his symbols are the sickle of Saturn, the Phrygian cap of Mithra, and the staff and ring, which represents his wisdom. There you have it. Now, when you dive into the mysteries of this, and you kind of connect the dots a little bit, you can see the same attributes that you can apply to the papacy, as well as to the Mithraic father. And if that doesn't spell it out for you, well, all you have to do is just look <clears throat> right here that the Pope in Latin, Papa from Greek, which means Papas, which means a child's word for father. So when we look at Antipas one more time, I know that it works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Okay, and we're just going to read the rest of it. This is impromptu. I, did not, I was not planning on doing this, but I'm going to read the rest of it. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which saying I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and to the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So, in the midst of this faithful martyr, 
or you could say in the midst of the faithful martyrs during the Reformation and these types of things, there were those that held to the doctrine of Balaam even within the church, the true church. But at the same time, there are those that has not denied the faith. And we can expect more Antipas here in the very near future, I do believe. And if that name attributes to you, then you, chances are, will be a faithful martyr. And those witnesses around you will see you slain in the midst of Satan's seat. And they'll see that you have not denied the faith. So again, Antipas means against the Father, um, which can metaphorically be applied to those um, that are witnesses against the Father here on this earth, which is the papacy, you know, and these types of things. So um, I figured I'd come at you with this little synopsis, um, with this little study. I think it went a little long, like they all do. <laughs> but who can complain, right? Um, so I hope you enjoyed this little nugget. Um, and until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. And one more thing I forgot to add, um, I'm going to provide you with this link here um, out of hopeofisrael.org. Now, I do not condone or support this site, but I did find this um, article very um, interesting, a very interesting read. Um, so if you want um, a little bit of a background between the similarities of Mithraism and the Catholic Church, I think this will be a good um, source for you to um, check out. Um, now, again, they you're going to have to read behind the whole um, rigmarole of the whole sacred name thing and these types of things because they kind of use that here. So if you can read between the lines there, um, then this will definitely be a good um, article to read as it as it uh, pertains. Like you have Constantine's pagan connection. There's um, some good stuff there. Um, Catholicism and persecution, Roman Catholic errors, um, and these types of things. Um, all that really can be traced back to Mithraism and these types of things. So, again, um, read be you know read read behind you know the uh, uh, the sacred name propaganda stuff that's being spewed here, and hopefully you can gather some information out here. This is basically a gleaning article. I don't expect you to, um, you know, agree with 100% of the uh, doctrine that they may throw in the midst of this paper or this article here. But um, there is some good stuff you can glean from here. So I will provide this link to so you can go and check this out um, at your leisure. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of other things you can go and search up and you know for comparisons between Mithraism and the Catholic Church um, that doesn't have this uh, confusion added into it um, but like I said you know there is some good stuff you can glean from here so I'll provide a link to this article here and um, so you can read it at, at your leisure so again thank you for listening God bless